Thank you, Leslie. All right, very good, very good. All right, so I think what we'll do is uh, we're gonna go ahead and do the show and tell for things that folks brought in here. And uh, maybe we'll just start from the my right, your left side of the room and kind of move forward with that. Walt, do you wanna talk a little bit about what you've brought in today? Yeah, so I brought in a couple things out of Tippecanoe County, uh, but they're collectibles. And we had planned on doing a collectible show or a Tippecanoe County collectible show. And we only had two people sign up. And so I'm gonna to propose to our committee to to expand it to other collectibles, either state, local, or whatever, that we do the show. It's not firm yet, but I'll show you an example of what I mean. I collect Marine Corps items, because I'm was i a Marine, and the first item is a Marine Corps license plate from 1929 Paris Island. Wow. Now, how rare is that? I mean, mm -hmm. if you know license plates and you know memorabilia, there couldn't have been that many that survived. So that's part of my Marine Corps collection. Cool. And then this is pretty obvious why I collect this. My last <laughs> name is Griffin. So in my going around collecting things, I couldn't always find, you know, local stuff. So I found some Griffin shoe polish things that I've collected over here. I don't have very many, but I do collect Griffin shoe polish. So that's a, another uh, collectible that I collect. So, so what I'm proposing to our committee is that we we expand this pro, uh, this uh, show to to include all collectibles, and maybe they have to submit what they're going to bring in, and then we can approve that. So, that's why I brought these two items in. Today. Very good. Thank Thanks, you. Walt. All right. Is Griffin local? No, it's not. I think it's uh, New York. The state of New York is where they're where they started. Okay, great. Thanks, Walt, for bringing that in. Jeff, you want to show us what you brought? Yep. Okay. Um, back in the 70s and 80s, the Exponent used to run original um, student-drawn art, and some of them were popular enough to be made into books. And these, they're not, you know, antique, but they're interesting collectibles, you know, the, this was uh, spurred on at the last meeting we had. We had a small discussion of McCutcheon and his drawings. So these are student drawn art over the years. The probably most famous one of these is Locomotives, which was by Rob Peterson, who went on to a career at a company called Pixar. <laughs> and he was uh, he was actually the director of one of the of a couple of the very famous Pixar animation features. So he's actually quite a name in Pixar's history as far as uh, advancing Pixar. So yeah, he's uh, and and you can't and you can't find these books anywhere. Uh, I told Jeff that uh, I did find one. I was looking for Bob Peterson's locomotives, and the only place I found it was one time I saw it on eBay for one hundred fifty dollars. <laughs> so if you happen to have one of these, and you know if you're a Purdue student at that time, you happen to have one of these in your collection, don't throw it out. Okay. <laughs> I was not a student at that time, but I worked on campus. And back then, the exponent would give away thousands of free copies every day. And you follow these cartoons and mm -hmm. continue yep. on. Very good. Okay. All right. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Oh, who's who's got something else here as we kind of move through the group? Okay, Mary. Four random pictures. I know Pete has told you that there's been an infinite amount of number of photos that were taken with the flood. And I have a large collection at home. But what I went through is I tried to pick out four that were a little bit different. And this one right here is uh, the operator of the of this particular is John Wagner. He worked for the railroad at the time. Um, and it was said that it was owned by a man by the name of Buster Brown. Well, that's a common name, and I wasn't able to find any information about Mr. Brown, but I was able to find information about Mr. Wagner, and he worked for the railroad and the electrical um, trolleys for many, many, many years. The next one is uh, most of these next four pictures, three pictures are all looking from West Lafayette to Lafayette. Uh, this happens to be the looking at the smokestacks from the old. Uh, powerhouse mm -hmm. and some various people waiting in line and being on the uh, boats that they were using to, to shuttle staff back and forth. 
And then the other two, there's another one here of um, showing the Big Four Railroad as well as another group of people shuttling back and forth. Mm -hmm. And most of these, all it just says is it's copied by. So I don't know if they're TSAJ pictures or if someone knows a picture, you know, recognizes it, who that particular owner might have been. And then the last one, um, it just says on the front of it, Petty, 1913. So I have no idea where this came from. I'm thinking it might have come off of a glass negative. Can you mm -hmm. see it? Mm -hmm. um, but it just says copied by so in, in 1955. So I don't have any idea on that. But I just thought that was so cool because that is definitely a different view of, of the bridge and mm -hmm. the, after everything had collapsed. Mm -hmm. So I thought these were a little bit different than the usual flood pictures. Good. So I'll pass them around and Great. let you guys look at them a little closer. Thanks for bringing those in. Okay, good. Anyone else have anything? Leslie, you have something. Okay, well, everybody knows I love Fort Wyatnon, right? So I went downstairs to the artifacts and what I really like about the artifacts, I like to get me thinking about the people that might have used these particular pieces. So I went down and I got some dinnerware that actually sat on the tables of the people that lived there. And um, when I was in fourth grade, I was taught that everybody wore burlap and was barefoot <laughs> and lived very primitive because that's the knowledge that we had at the time, right? Well, with the excavations at Wiatnan and other places, we now know that these people brought their beautiful things with them. And this is an example, it's called faience. And we have some of the finest china available in Paris at the time. And we keep our ceramics and everything next to the many drawers of bones. And we have a lot of passenger pigeon bones. <laughs> so I can pretty much guarantee you passenger pigeons were probably served on these dishes. Yeah. <laughs> um, bison and elk and bear and sturgeon. So again, when I look at things like this, it helps me get a better understanding of how these people were you know, and how they live. And I think that it's neat that they brought their beautiful things with them mm -hmm. from their home country. Very good. Very good. Thanks, Leslie, for bringing those in. All right. Well, any others? Did I miss anybody? Okay. So good. Uh, Hi, Ned. What'd you bring? Old, an old book. An old book. An old book. An old new book. I tell you what, you need to have the author sign that. Well, I, I've got one of them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we're going to talk about, uh, go to the show and tell part of it. We'll kind of move on to the, um, to our presentation here. And before I get started, I've got a couple things I want to show you just, uh, again, to kind of share with you. This 1913 flood business was good money for publishers. And you had such wonderful things as the story of the great flood and cyclone disasters of 1913, or tragic story of America's greatest disaster, complete authentic tornado flood and fire in Ohio, Indiana, Nebraska, and Mississippi Valley states. Or I like this one with the, if you can see the picture on the front, the damsel in stress basically here, horrors of tornado and fire the memorial edition okay and then of course 100 years later we had a new set of crop books that came out uh washed away by jeff williams uh who was actually it was a pretty good uh, pretty good article and then we got a more recent one that we'll kind of talk about later so uh <laughs> the point is, is that this was quite a uh quite a, a uh, event that occurred and most of it most of us think of it as being kind of a local event but it's actually more along the lines of a national event so let me kind of get rid of this here and we'll move on to our. There's the gate there from Logansport it's called the Logansport gate, which had the same flood. Really? Oh, yes, yes. And yeah. There's three or four books on that up there called it, which I didn't even bring. Oh, cool. Well, that's good to know. Well, we've got, <clears throat> okay, hopefully we've got. All right, Jeff, we're not, we're not responding, Jeff. Uh, use the regular mouse to click on the... All right, let's try that. 
There we go. All right. All right. So although we do talk about locally, and again, local paper uh, monitored this with their local stories, but the actual, there were a lot of events that occurred three days before the actual rain started for the flood itself. Thousands of communities actually experienced gale force storms on March 21st, 22nd. The rains didn't start till 23rd or 24th. So even before that, this is all part of a storm complex that came in through this period of time affecting all these communities. Down south, we had dozens killed by tornadoes that blasted through on Friday, March 21st before Easter. And then on Omaha, uh, there was a set of tornadoes that came out of there on Easter Sunday before that. And it wasn't until after that that the rains actually came and started to affect us. So this was actually part of a much bigger story that went on uh, with weather that, that started before that. In fact, the reason being is that this year, 1913, was an El Nino year. And for that reason, uh, the warm Pacific waters, as you know, you've heard this talked about in the press, pretty much forced the uh, Gulf air up into the mid part of the United States. Now, unlike Europe that has lots of mountain ranges in our Midwest Plains, obviously we have nothing that prevents cold air from Canada and warm air from down south from coming up through the middle of the country and colliding just like you see here. And this was kind of the, the gameplay as was set up prior to all these storms happening with that. Well, on Friday, the Friday before the flood really began, citizens of Indiana, uh, Lafayette woke up to close to 60 mile an hour winds blowing through town, gale force winds that basically blew off, shingles off the uh, Amos Hevelin Tower. They smashed it into the clock. They stopped that uh, and right cold uh, with the states and everything. Telephone lines, telegraph lines ripped out of the ground, poles twisted them up. Lots of stories that relate to this gale that came through. There was one fatality with that. Poor Henry Walter, six o'clock in the morning, was getting up to go get some milk at the local uh, dairy to, for his wife, who was ailing. And as he was walking down Main Street, probably against this gale force wind with his head down, his collar up and so forth. Again, remember, this is a cold wind, okay? He probably didn't hear the sound off the Foster Furniture Company of this huge wooden placard coming loose in the gale, whipping off and crushing his skull as it struck him on the left side of his skull. He was found underneath board by somebody who took him over to, to home hospital. They actually had to find an ambulance to take him up. But by the time he got there, poor Henry had had expired. Now, if there is be a good side to it, it is that once this particular accident happened, it stimulated the legislature to pass stricter restrictions on how these huge wooden placards were actually mounted on buildings after that. There was a fatality actually associated with the, the uh, period before the actual flood started. And telegraph lines and so forth, poles were ripped out of the ground or snapped off, essentially, and this is important, cutting off all communication out, especially from small communities like Lafayette, Indiana. So let's, that was Friday. Now, Saturday and, and Easter Sunday, March 22nd and 23rd. Pretty much people did what they always do. They always, they cleaned up afterwards. Okay, after the gale had come through. And on Saturday, we were rewarded with nice warm weather. That Gulf surge that was coming up with nice warm temperatures and lots of moisture came into, just kind of like that we had this past week, remember? A nice warm weather we had and everything. Well, that's kind of what happened there also. Unfortunately, even though we got up into the 70s, look, started 30 degrees at dawn, and by the afternoon was 70. It happened last week, didn't it? it happened that way also, okay? So farther west, out west in Colorado, there was a cold front that was barreling across the Rockies, swooping down to the plains and running smack dab into this unstable moisture coming out of the Gulf. And the process, we all know what happens. Tornado activities, storms, and so forth. In fact, it was an unseasonably warm Easter afternoon up in Omaha, Nebraska. It was 73 degrees. And everybody thought, it's spring. About 5 o'clock, as would be expected with spring, they started to notice that the afternoon thunderstorm started, and they saw the dark clouds kind of gathering. And they thought, well, typical spring thunderstorm. But it turned out to be anything but. This is a photograph of the Omaha tornado. This little monster was a quarter wide, quarter of a mile wide, and it stayed on the ground for over 85 miles. This was just one of several tornadoes that actually sprung out of this. The first one actually started in Greenwood, which is about 40 miles west of Omaha, hit the ground and stayed on the ground the whole time. It entered into the southwest side of Omaha, cut a path straight through the middle of the town to the northeast side where it exited. Winds were estimated to be over 200 miles an hour, 
over 200 miles an hour. The problem was, as we would all know, in 1913, there was no way to warn. People started ringing church bells, shooting off guns, screaming and yelling, trying to holler to let them know a tornado was coming, but pretty much to no avail. Most people were caught out in the when the tornado hit. For that reason, bodies were found in trees miles away or buried under debris or uh, flung miles away from where they were with that. People often make stories about running towards a uh, storm shelter and never making it because there wasn't enough time. That's how quickly it seemed to emerge. There were four tornadoes in there, about a collective force of about an EF4. And you know, on that EF, that scale, that five G scale, five is the finger of God. It's the worst that it can be. This was an EF4, winds up to 260 miles an hour. It killed 168 people in Nebraska. With telegraph wires down and so forth, there was no way to tell people who were downstream of this storm that it was coming. No way to communicate. And so what they ended up doing is they actually put a courier on a train to Fort Omaha that wasn't too far away. From there, there was an intact line to Fort Riley, Kansas, where they were able to get the message out to the rest of the world. But of course, that took several hours to actually get that accomplished. By that time, the storm had wrecked a lot of, uh, a lot of damage. Now, the tornado after it left Omaha split. One track headed up towards Michigan, another headed towards Indiana, where it arrived in Terre Haute, Indiana, Easter night. And of course, because it was at night, people were unaware, totally taken unaware by the fact that it was a tornado coming out of the middle of the night. 21 people died in Terre Haute on that event. 250 were injured. And you can see here, this is a basement. All that's left of a home, the base literally lifted the entire structure off and dumped it next to it. Yeah. They like the tornado that hit Omaha, like the same one? Or was the same storm path. Yeah, same storm path, basically, with that, with that uh, probably not the same tornado stayed on the ground for the entire time, but that same supercell basically traveled right into Indiana. Now, the good news is that it tapered off before it hit Lafayette, okay, because it was headed towards it, and it tapered off in Michigan. That was kind of the end terminus of it. It was about Terre Haute, Attica area, where it finally ended up. And then break began. Now, here we are in beautiful Lafayette, and we are uh, downstream of the majority of, of the uh, Wabash River watershed, as you see right here. And of course, our problem is not that we have rain here. We also pick up all the rain that is upstream. And you see that the Wabash originates actually uh, just outside of Defiance, Ohio, very close to a reservoir. Uh, there in Ohio, and uh, that's where the, where it originates. And we basically drain the entire eastern side of the state through the through the Wabash itself. The problem we had was not only heavy rains that landed here, and again, I was just telling uh, talking before our, our presentation here. Purdue University, over the span of these floods, flooding rains, recorded 4.59 inches at the ag station here during that period of time. 4.59. The problem wasn't just the rain; it was the fact that this was March. Even though the temperature was 70 degree water, the was still close and where to go. So it went into the tributaries, dumped directly into the watershed. So that brings us up to Monday, March 24th, 1913, Mulberry, Indiana. Two brothers, Roy and Roscoe Rothenberger, and their friend Alva Myers decided they want to do some duck shooting. So they just built a John boat and floated it out there with the idea of going into the areas around the Wildcat Creek to do some hunting. Even though it's raining, you know, they're teenagers and teenagers have no sense. So, you know, pretty much you're gonna get out there in the rain and do that. Well, there's the South Fork of Wildcat Creek, a very placid looking little place. And this was the John boat, typical John boat. So these are not exactly what you would call navigable craft for turbulent water. Yeah, this is what they got into. Now, the thing is, their thinking wasn't too far off because out of the mainstream of the flood through the Wabash or through the Wildcat, it was pretty placid. And you've seen that because basically well, the water was just flowing over the farmland. So this is modern day flooding on the Wildcat. And you'll notice that there's a little bit of white caps in here. There's a fair amount of turbulence in here. The Wildcat is not what you would call a nice placid floodplain. It is one that has a lot of turbulence in it because it's very narrow, fairly shallow, and the water spreads out pretty quickly. And you can see it tends to get rather high based on that tree that's perched at the middle of the creek. 
Well, the creek was flooded almost a mile wide that morning that they launched their John boat into the water. At some point, the boat ventured a little too close to the main current, and so doing pulled into the main current. And when it did, it actually ended up against a tree, pinned against the tree. They were unable to get it actually uh, away from the tree at all. And as they tried to get it, the boat capsized, throwing all three of them into the water. Roy Rothenberg was wearing waders. He was pulled under within a matter of minutes and died, okay, or drowned. Um, his brother Roscoe held on to the boat when it came free from the uh, tree against which it was pinned and floated downstream with it, went around the bend and Elva Myers never saw him again. Elva Myers, the third of them, the third of the three guys, hung onto branches of a submerged willow tree and yelled for help. The problem was he was 165 feet away from ground, from dry land, and there was nobody out there. It was raining, it was cold, it was miserable. A slight technical issue. Okay. Okay. I good? We think so. Okay, I need to get control back here. Sorry. All right, here we go. Thing was, he his cries were not even heard for an hour while he was hanging on to the submerged willow tree in this freezing cold water for an hour. Going to be um, a farmer who was also named Rothenberger was just passing by to check on some cattle that he had, and he happened to hear this sound off in the distance. In an investigation, he found Elma Myers, or saw Elma Myers, out in the water, hanging onto this willow tree. Well, it took him about two hours to go back to Mulberry, some help, find a boat, back to the creek. Where they so by that time, he'd been in the water about three and a half hours or so, okay? They got him back to land and they literally had to pry his fingers off the tree because of the hypothermia and just so cold. Um, but he'd been in the icy water for about four hours, but he recovered. He did recover. So the three boys, he was the only one that recovered. The body of Roy Rothenberger was not found till April 8th by a church party composed of people of his church who were actually wandering up, going up and down Wildcat Creek looking for Roy and Roscoe. The body of Roscoe was never found. This brings us to Tuesday, March 25th, Lafayette, Indiana. Here's our map. By Tuesday, it had been raining for almost two days now. Okay, so the, and of course, this was not only in Lafayette, but also in the watershed, the whole watershed for Lafayette. Crowds were gathered on both sides because the water level is up. We're well above flood stage. The flood stage here in, in Lafayette is 11 feet. Water by Tuesday was probably about 13 to 15 feet. And there's a lot of debris coming down, which made for great spectacular viewing from a voyeuristic point of view, okay? Because you would see a shed, a barn shed, intact, floating down the river and seeing it smash against the piers of the bridge, okay? Occasionally you'd see birds perched on it. There was one, one story about a raft with a rabbit and two chickens sitting on it that went merrily downstream, okay? <laughs> so it was, it, was kind of, it was kind of entertainment, I guess. And so people were walking across the Main Street Bridge and the bridge trying to get a good view of everything. Well, Paul Wangren decided to walk out on the Brown Street Bridge for a better look, and this is where the Brown Street Bridge would have been in 1913. And he was joined by another gentleman called Charlie Burkhouse, and they thought, let's go out and take a look. And so they did. They walked out on the Brown Street Bridge. But as they approached the west side of the Brown Street Bridge, they heard a sound. And the people on the shore described it as an earthquake, followed by the sound of twisting metal. And what was happening is with a horrible moan, the twisting ironwork and the western pier of the Brown Street Bridge disappeared. It crumbled, taking the two major trusses with it. See, that's where the missing spans are. There should be a pier right in the middle of that, and that pier is what uh, plunged. Well, Wanger and Burkhouse, at first having a little bit of hearing this sound, of course, and then suffering a bit of sphincter flutter, <laughs> basically ran for their lives to get to the west end of that bank. But they made it. At the sound, they took off running, and they made it just as the bridge collapsed behind them. The was were they, on, were they on the bridge? They were on the bridge when it started to go, and they made it to right here, Oops. the bankment. Now you notice there's a problem here. <laughs> water, 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 water. Okay, <laughs> so now they're stuck. Okay, because there's no way they're going to be able to get up to uh, Ellsworth Road, which is now what we call River Road, which was the closest dry land uh, without having to cross the river. 
Now, this is a picture of the Brown Street Bridge is actually after the, uh, after the uh, flood itself. And you can see this is one of the two trusses that was dumped into the river here. The other one ended up down by the railroad bridge. But these were not just the, uh, what they call pony trusses, or like that you see here. These are beautiful arched trusses. And those are the ones that collapsed and went into the river. Of course, you can see that this is the western abutment over here. So this is West Lafayette over on this side. And this is all that's left of, of really that bridge. And this still stands today. This is still over there on the end of the Brown Street uh, levee that you can go and see today. In fact, that's a picture of it right there. The problem was with uh, Langer and Burkhouse, it's a rising Ash River it was rising at a span of about six inches an hour. So every 10 minutes or so, it was going up an inch. So while they're standing there for half an hour, the water was going up and covering their feet. They soon found themselves standing in the flowing water. And of course, onlookers who were on the Main Street Bridge when the Brown Street Bridge collapsed saw what happened with the two of them escaping and getting to the end. And so they alerted authorities who tried to get organized some sort of uh, rescue attempt. Well, onlookers tried to launch boats, but there was a lot of turbulence with the water, as you'll see in some of these pictures. But two Purdue students, Leland Woolery and George Ely, grabbed a, or Eli, grabbed a canoe and actually tried to make for rescuing the two stranded men who were way out on the Brown Street uh, Levee Pier. To give you an idea of what we're talking about, <coughs> Langren and, and Burkhouse are stranded there where the arrow is. And then Woolery and Eli pushed off from here. Now remember, what's going on here is that this flood is cascading from the north to the south with the flow of the river. And it is coming into this area here and then pouring into these lowlands. These are nothing like they are today as far as elevation. They're much lower. And so water is actually pouring into this center area here between Main Street and Brown Street and creating a tremendous turbulence as the water flows through it. So they said, uh, so what they did is Eli set out for the canoe across the coal yard um, of the, of the uh, Lafayette Coal Barn, which the arrow shows you where the coal barn is. This, uh, just for your orientation, this garage right here is where Ruby of Flowers is now, okay? And right behind that, of course, is Starbucks, all right? To give you an idea. Main Street is off to the left, or off to the right, Brown Street off to the left. But about 30 feet from shore, they hit turbulence. And one of the way simply capsized that canoe. I mean, it was incredibly turbulent. Eli was carried towards the roof of the coal barn, and he swam the rest of the distance, was able to get to it. But Woolery was pulled the other way. He basically floated out towards the river. He managed to grab onto a tree for a few minutes, but was ripped free because of the tor uh, torrents, uh, the turbulence that was in that area. He disappeared underwater. When he came back up, he appeared to be unconscious and he was swept out into the river. So essentially what happened is they started off from the main street levee down here, the canoe capsized. Eli managed to go this way, get onto the West Lafayette coal barn roof. Woolery went the other way, swept by the current, because again, the current's coming in like this, but it's then heading back out to the river as it moves along the main street uh, levee. And that was what carried Woolery away to his death. Captain John Cluth what happened to be in the area and was on the main street levee trying to direct rescue attempts for Wang Grin and Burkhouse. And uh, the roof of, so now he's got to deal with Eli, because Eli's sitting on the roof of this coal barn and he has seen Captain, or Captain Kluth has seen many other structures lifted up in total and floated downstream to be bashed against the railroad bridge, including the huge livestock farm uh, barns that were in the, uh, the Chauncey lowlands. Huge wooden structures that literally were lifted off their foundation and then smashed against the, the bridge piers themselves. They figured this coal barn was going to go the same way, taking Eli with him. So it was too far away to throw a rope to him. And Captain Kluth was not going to risk any more of his uh, sending out any of his officers to in boats to rescue Eli or Wanger and Burkhouse because he saw what happened before. However, for Eli, there was a telephone wire that ran from a telephone pole to the barn. In fact, this is a photograph of rescue going on in real time. What you have here is this is the main street levee that we're looking at. Brown Street levee would be over here. The coal barn is right over here. Here's our rescue party right there. And what happened is they put, they took a Purdue student, because Purdue students will do anything. <laughs> they made the student climb up the telephone pole, the two wires running to the, to get two wires, they're running to the coal barn roof. And this is a photograph of the Purdue student sitting on the cross arm of that telephone pole. And so what the student did is he snipped one of the wires, 
attached a rope to it, and Eli took the other end of the wire that was attached to the barn and pulled the rope to him. So now Eli's got a rope that ran from the pole to the barn, and he has secured it to the barn. So he's, now he's got a rope across here, a way to get out. Except, except, he's about to pull himself across that when Captain Kluth realized that rope's going to sag as soon as he puts any weight on it whatsoever. And he's going to be immediately in that violent, turbulent water. And he's going to get swept away just like Woolery did. So he told them to hold up. And what they did is they snapped the, they cut the wire, attached the second rope to it. And again, Eli pulled the wire and the second rope to him. He tied the rope around himself. The rope was still on the levee. And the rescuers all had the other end of the rope. So now what they did is Eli lowered himself into the water and he started to go hand over hand like this, but he didn't get very far before the turbulent water basically wrenched it free. So the rescuers just dragged as fast as they could to drag him underwater, I might add, to about, uh, he got within about 10 feet of the shore and he became stuck on a fallen tree. Uh, Captain Kluth and a gentleman named Walter Clark, who was a reporter with the Lafayette Morning Journal, and that will become important here in a second, they dragged Eli the rest of the way to the shore and rescued him. Now, when he came to, when Eli came to, the first thing he asked about was Woolery, what had happened to him. He was told that Woolery drowned. And Eli collapsed. He was taken by car to his home on Grand Street. And that's a photograph of actually Eli being taken away. So <clears throat> this, the, you can't see the title for this, but it is a myth, misconception, OK? In these finely written and reviewed publications, there's a very interesting story that is in every single one of them about how Eli was rescued. And it goes something like this. Now, the rescue I just described to you was reported by Lafayette Morning Journal's Walter Clark, the guy who was involved with rescuing Eli. And he wrote the description in the Lafayette Morning Journal. But the competing paper, the Lafayette Daily Courier, had a different version of this. It was a little bit more, as we would say, creative. Well, according to the Lafayette Daily Courier, the boat was attached to the rope. They tried to get the boat to Eli. It failed. So they got the boat back somehow, and they attached a pulley to the end of the rope. Eli reels in the rope, has this pulley, and he also has a wire running from the pole to the barn. See where I'm going with this? So he attached, he literally attached the pulley to one of the cut wires. He then somehow sent the wire back to the shore. And this is where it gets a little fuzzy to me because I'm trying to picture how these things are going back and forth across it. But somehow the wire got back to shore. They reattached that wire to the, to the telephone pole. So now there's a wire with a pulley on it that Eli can hang on to and do a zip line safely to shore. As great as that is, as far as press publication, finding in all the stories that were passed around in each one of these, including the one that was written for the centennial, it's likely not true because we have a reliable witness whose report was recorded in the newspaper who was actually there and participating in the rescue. But that story wasn't good enough to make it into the popular press. So anyway, so Burkhaus and Wangren, they're still standing out there in their little island. Okay, which is filled up with water. Way right out there. Okay, this is a view actually looking at this is a more advanced stage of the flood because the, the levees are both really covered. But this is actually standing next to Ellsworth Road, which is River Road on the on the escarpment, kind of the West Lafayette escarpment looking out. So way out there. Now yeah, yep, good. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, Main Street is is uh, right about here. It was actually right here where the, where the uh, trees are, Quinn. And then this is Brown Street here, okay? And it comes up and that garage is right there where they come together. Okay, good, yeah. So uh, it just so happened that again, Main Street Levee was not flooded with water yet at the point of this rescue going. Roy B. Whitesell, who happened to be a veterinarian, had an infirmary close to the bridge on Main Street. And he also had a boat, which he launched into the turbulent the Lafayette Morning Journal described Weitzel's attempt to rescue the most daring feat ever performed by a boatman. He actually rowed against the current through this turbulent water to Wangren and Burkhouse. He was able to go just beyond where they were, drift back, and hook the boat up to a telephone pole. 
to which then Wanger and Burkhouse were able to make a couple of yards step to get into his boat, which they did. And then he was able to safely navigate them back and deposit them back on the Main Street levee successfully. So again, interesting story about Whitesell. After this daring attempt and a successful rescue, he disappeared. And people thought his infirmary ended up floating downstream. And they thought he went with it. And so for a number of days, he was considered missing and presumably dead until one day he happened to show up in a grocery store and pick up supplies, in which case I go, yeah, I'm perfectly alive. Okay. <laughs> which the paper had to then publish that Dr. Whitesell's been found. Okay. So, so anyway, at the peak of the flood, this is what it looked like from the West side, just for orientation. This is the railroad embankment, which you notice is above water. Okay. Above water. That embankment was high enough. It was acting as a dam to actually interfere with the flow of the water through here. There's a best house or what they call the detention hospital is located on the banks of the Wabash to the railroad bridge. The Main Street Bridge is still right here, okay? And Main Street Levee is running off this way. And then what you've got in between, there's the west shore of the Wabash. That's the whole flooded levee area, the West Lafayette, and then there's River Road. It was nothing but water from River Road all the way to the river. Now, at the peak of the flood, the typical river level is about four to 6.5 feet, although at some points, uh, <coughs> the actual official level of the Wabash has been less than a foot. But official flood stage is 11 feet, and it's still 11 feet. Our typical spring flood, like we had some flooding in December, okay? If you, walked, if you drove along I-65, you saw the water in the fields there. The old golf course is covered in water. That was about 16 to 17 feet. That's typically what we have. The peak of the flood for, the, um, for our 1913 flood that occurred on uh, 10 o'clock p.m. on Wednesday, March 26, 32.9 feet, 32.9 feet, over twice what we get into the flood, okay? So again, that's a heck of a lot of water. To give you an idea of how much that is, all that flood water was being pushed along downstream, but it couldn't get past the embankment. It was all being channeled underneath the railroad bridge at a tremendous velocity. How fast you say? Well, hydrologists estimate that 190,000 cubic feet per second passed under that bridge and flowed over the main and Brown Street levee. Now I'll give you a perspective of how big that is. The flow over Niagara Falls is only 100,000. Only 52% of what was flowing through Lafayette per second during the peak of the flood. So can you imagine the force behind all that? No, no wonder that structures were totally picked up and just dislodged, totally. But the railroad bridge held on. And part of the reason why the railroad bridge held on is because they brought in coal cars loaded with coal from uh, Terre Haute Southern Railroad and put it onto the bridge simply to keep the platform in place on top of the bridge, okay? <clears throat> That's a close-up of it showing the loaded coal cars on the bridge and kind of a closer view right here where you can see them all lined up along here. They also had the workers uh, trying to reinforce the embankment because, again, as you can imagine, that water flowing and hitting that embankment was eroding it away. In fact, there's two. At the time, this uh, 1913, there were two tracks coming off that bridge, a north and a southbound track. And at the time of this photograph was taking the northbound track, which would have been up behind over air. So the rail air. These guys on the southbound track are throwing everything from gravel to tires to timbers onto the embankment, trying to reinforce the embankment. That was an effort that went on the whole time during the flood. That's where the bottom of the railroad bridge is. So now when you go over the Leslie Memorial Bridge from Lafayette to West Lafayette, and you see that railroad bridge, look down. That's how high the flood was. It was nothing underneath the bridge. And that's part of the reason why that boat is actually penned up against it because it was basically trying to be churned up by the water, ground up into pieces, and then passed underneath it, just like all the other debris that came floating downstream, including debris from the Purdue Circus or Peru Circus. Um, the problem, though, there's a whole nother story there, but uh, the Peru Circus was in town, of course, or was for wintering in, in Peru, and they were hit with the flood, lost animals and all their materials. They ended up floating downstream. So animal carcasses like elephants, zebras, et cetera, came floating down through Lafayette. Okay, so here's the Main Street Bridge before the 1913 flood and after. Do you see a difference? It's just a little bit twisted, okay? 
Well, the Main Street Bridge did not fail. It did not fall down, did not collapse, even though all parties were figuring that it was going to go at any time. And there's a reason for that. And it looks something like this. This is a cross section showing the Wabash River bottom, which is all sediment, by the way. There's no bedrock in our area of the Wabash River, not for several hundred feet. It's all set up. So when they build a bridge, well, for those of you who've been in the community long enough, think celery bog and the bridge over that, okay? Not too much different. The way they actually built bridges back then is they would put in 60 foot pilings driven into the river bottom and then formed into a, a platform, if you will, of these pilings one after the other. Onto that, they put these huge timbers that formed a platform or what they called a bridge. And it was only on that that they then built the stone piers. So the stone piers were not resting at the bottom of the river. They were resting on these platforms instead. Because if they had been resting on the, on the river bottom, the sediment would have slowly gone away, the piers would have sunk. So <clears throat> the problem we had here is that the Main Street Bridge had been expanded, had been enlarged from side to side to accommodate a rail track through there from the uh, Fort Wayne North in the Northern Indiana Railway. In so doing, think about what happened here. It made the pier longer. Water's flowing this way. On the downside of that pier, it formed an eddy. And that eddy essentially scoured out all the, all the sediment that was on that downside. In so doing, it removed the stability of those piers and one by one, they tore loose and floated downstream until there were only four columns of piers left. Now, elementary education of physics and gravity would tell you that this is not good. <laughs> and indeed, it had resulted in a 30 degree tip to the bridge itself, not collapsing, simply tipping it. And that's what you see right there, it's the tipping of the bridge itself. This iron work itself kept it from totally collapsing, actually had to stabilize it a little bit. And so it just had a 30 degree tip. But they actually put, sent down a diver to that wall to actually examine what went. And when he walked underneath that grillage, that platform, he was able to actually walk underneath the grillage and look up at the bottom of the platform. So that's how much damage there was done. Well, other scenes from the peak of the flood itself, this is again of the uh, states are on uh, River Road, and this is the embankment that's still there, you know, the, the bridge that goes over River Road, the railroad bridge that goes over River Road. This is Main Street in Lafayette, West Lafayette, I mean, and you're looking up Chauncey Hill, Old Bruno's, Swiss Inn used to be on the corner there, and that's River Road crossing it there. And this was the point, even though this, this part of Main Street Levee and Broad Street Levee were the farthest from the water, they were the lowest part of the levee. And they were the first place that was washed away when the water actually breached the levee itself. Now, because of that, and this is again, standing at about that same location close to uh, Ellsworth Road or River Road and looking down Main Street, you had water cascading and it cavitated for this, essentially dug out holes that were 10 feet deep on the other side of the levee. The levee itself was closed of asphalt and concrete, but the dirt on the other side certainly wasn't. And so it swept away. And so what you ended up with is buildings precariously perched, surrounded by nothing, because the soil had all been washed away. And I've got another picture here that shows that from the other side. Oops, all right. Which I will, come on. Okay, all right. Anyway, I guess I'm not gonna, let me see those pictures. In fact, I'm tending to run out of something here, Jeff. Yeah, not responding. Let me get rid of that. Let's see if I got control here. Nope. So what we <clears throat> what we had with this destruction is as soon as the water went down, which it did pretty quickly. In the span of about four days, the water level was almost back to near normal in the river that quickly. But the problem was is life doesn't go on that way because you no longer have a safe way of getting across the river. Remember at that particular time, West Lafayette had no utilities of its own other than water. It was totally derived, what's that, think you got it? Uh, I don't know, I do, thank you, all right. Um, West Lafayette had no utilities of its own. It got its power, 
It's electricity, it's gas, it's water, or well, it's not much of it's water. It did have that old tank, it's up on top of Salisbury. Okay, it did have that tank. Okay, so I had a little water, but gas lines and everything, a telegraph, telephone were all set across the bridges from Lafayette to West Lafayette. And when the bridges went, so did that umbilical that sent all that power and utilities to the West side. So, and plus most of the people who worked over in the West side lived in Lafayette. And so getting across those bridges was essential for everyday life. And so when they implemented these barges, they created on the fly, the bridge company and a couple other private firms and the river boys of Connorsville, which is a section of uh, around St. Anne's down here in Lafayette, who were guys who really understood the river, built these barges and went to work making lots of money, taking people across from anywhere from free to an ungodly fee of 25 cents a person. But you know, everybody paid it because they had to get across. And it was not only people, but it was livestock, uh, produce. You know, things were shipped in by rail to Lafayette and then transported over to West Lafayette. So again, in all these pictures, you see the same thing. and People standing on the shore waiting to go. Now, this happened to be one particular barge that as it was going across, the guideline it was attached to snapped. Started spinning with the current headed right towards those stone piers of the railroad bridge. If it hit that, it would have smashed it into smithereens. Fortunately, it didn't. It passed between the piers, and as it went on the other side, worked on the rail deck, threw ropes down to the gentleman who grabbed the rope, and about four or five of them grabbed onto four different ropes. They actually halted the barge before it went any further. Now, what do you do? Well, you're sitting in a river. You got four guys holding your barge. Well, they, they moved the women folk and children off by boats, like you see here. And then the guys had to climb the ropes. <laughs> yeah, I hope they were in good shape. Okay. Now, they did implement a shuttle service over the railroad line, which was still intact uh, for a day or two with the Lake Erie and Western. But the problem was, after a period of time and closer inspection, they saw that the railroad bridge also had damage to it, and they stopped that also. So essentially, the two sides were cut off with the exception of this ferry service that went across. As we can see, this is the, this is the Brown Street uh, levee before the, uh, the torrent actually got going. You can see how we get a feel for the degree of turbulence in this water and why it was so turbulent with the water flowing across through that cut. Eventually, it totally covered the, the levee itself. In fact, this is a photograph, probably the last photograph of the uh, Brown Street Bridge before its demise. Okay, you can see the water starting to come across. You got the guardrails and everything. And you see the arches there? That was the spans that were lost. This you is the west side. It, yeah, exactly. Good point. This is the west side looking down Brown Street. Yep, exactly. And this is the same view, except now it looks a little bit different. This is all that was left of the levee was just the rubble. And if you see the bridge back here in the back, again, we're looking down Brown Street, the arches are gone because those are the ones that went into the water. That's what it looks like a little closer up. Again, you can see Lafayette in the background looking at it. That's all that was really left of the levee. Look at it from another angle. This is after they'd actually plowed a road in there, but nobody was getting through that. So essentially, even um, if you were able to get across at Brown Street, you didn't have a way of getting to the rest of the city. So the Brown Street bridges piers were replaced and rebuilt. And the bridge reopened in November 1913. So again, they went on for this... Uh, using the barges and everything for a period of about six months. The bridge survived the 1958 flood, which was a pretty high flood. But in 73, a crack was found, a 13 foot crack, no less, in that same pier that had been replaced. And the pier itself had shrunk or had sunk about two inches. So the bridge was closed, repairs began. And after a year of trying to repair the bridge, on one day they came in and noticed the pier had dropped an additional foot at which point they declared the bridge totally unsafe and they demolished the bridge in October of 1974. And that was the last of the Brown Street Bridge. So that was what happened to the Brown Street Bridge. <clears throat> and of course, the only thing that's left today is that west side abutment. The Main Street Bridge sparked an incredible controversy. And if you, if you look at uh, our book that Arnie and I wrote, it tells you a lot of the stories that went into that. It was a mess. It was a mess because they couldn't decide whether to replace it or repair it. And even after they decided to replace it, the design, the controversy that went on with that was just incredible because if some people had their way, we would have had this beautiful curving 
bridge of concrete and steel. It probably would have been wiped out by the first came after 1913 because it was not built or not designed to handle water flow underneath. But this format, this structure of bridge was. And so fortunately, this one won out. Now, the problem was you still don't have traffic going across there. And the uh, Fort Wayne North, North Indiana Rail Car Company that uh, did all the streetcars here in town, they were losing money because they weren't able to operate. And they said, we're gonna put up money to actually build a temporary bridge parallel to the Main Street Bridge, which is over here on the left, and actually be able to run a rail across there so we can do streetcar service and help people get across there and we can stay in business. So they did that and they started that in the summer of 1913, not too long after, again, the flood itself. It was not without mishap. This is a picture of the uh, steam pile driver that you saw in the previous picture has tipped over, the steam boiler has actually landed on the ground. A little hard to see, but in this picture at the bottom of it, there's a guy down here that fell down here, it fell the, uh, blow off the, the tenant or bird. The second person who was injured is under the steam somewhere there. Both of them did survive. Both of them did survive. But the bridge, uh, the temporary bridge with the walkway and the rail line next to it, you can see it over here, was completed in the fall of 1913, and in the winter of 1913, it was destroyed. Okay, so <laughs> it was destroyed. That's the remnants of it right there, okay, floating in it. An ice jam came through, destroyed the temporary bridge, knocking it out of commission completely. What's the yep. big bridge right there? Okay, this is actually, this picture was taken actually in uh, late 1914, uh, or, or excuse me, late 1913. And what it's showing here is that this is actually part of the new bridge being constructed. This is, this is the old Main Street pillar, but the steel beams that you see going across here are the beginnings of the new Main Street bridge, okay? So I'll show you here in just a second here. Good question. So <clears throat> the problem they had with this bridge is they had to actually, the Main Street Bridge, they had to get rid of the old piers while they poured the new ones and put coffer dams in at the same time. So what we're seeing in this picture is actually these stone type piers here are the old bridge, the concrete ones being poured back here, are the new ones. And you still see the old steel trusses from the old Main Street Bridge on top that had to be replaced. So it's quite an operation. Again, showing you kind of the, how they had to put the coffer dams in and then pour the concrete forms for the new bridge while leaving, they left the steel structures in for a period of time while they were working. But with the new engineering design, this was a revolutionary design <clears throat> with these huge steel beams is what they were coming in. They put those in and then they covered them with concrete. And so you see something like that, here's a steel beam, but here's what it looked like when it's covered with the facade, the concrete facade that we're familiar with in looking at the, the current walkway that what used to be the Main Street Bridge. But it took them about 16 months after the flood to actually get the construction of the bridge completed. So over a year, over a year, it took them through all the wrangling and all the other things to actually get the Main Street Bridge constructed. Yep. Is our walking bridge today that? Good question. Because in 1996, railroad relocation ended the use of the Main Street Bridge and we know it today is the John T. Myers pedestrian bridge. It's still there with the same concrete poured structures that it had in 1914. Okay. So again, well constructed now. So yeah, so there you go. Yeah. Those big concrete piles, uh, are those sitting still on platforms? And Good question. They used a different type of, of format for those. And interestingly enough, if you want to know how the street was, the bridge was constructed, we have a copy of a 1915 thesis written by the chief engineer of this project that describes and provides blueprints of how they built the entire bridge in our collection, a digital copy of that. I happened to find that thanks to Quentin. I happened to find an article uh, that Clinton sent me that mentioned this engineer had written a thesis, had attended Purdue University, gets a degree in engineering. So we have that. So that's that's really cool. So all the things about all the details with it, since it was done by an engineer are all laid out in these huge blueprints and everything with that. 
and are available digitally. So yeah, so I'm not certain, Patrick, actually how they did it, yeah. Uh, Leland Maloney's body wasn't found until the floodwaters receded uh, with that, and it, it wasn't until April 5th. And he was found at the pest house, the detention hospital. It's just after the railroad bridge you see on the right-hand side there. Because again, remember, this is the bottleneck. And because of the bottleneck, as the water passed through here, the turbine water passed through here, it formed an eddy right here. And so all this debris accumulated in front of the detention house right here, including Leland Woolery's body, which was found among the debris on April 5th. He was memorialized at Purdue during Memorial Day in 1913, and there was a plaque that was placed in Memorial Gymnasium. Again, that gymnasium was the one that was built in 1908 for the Purdue student uh, students who were killed in the wreck of 1903. And it's now Felix Haas Hall, but that plaque is still there. So could it happen again? Well, here's our historic flood crest. This is the top 13 floods in their timeline when they happen. The red line indicates the 11 foot flood line, okay? So what we see is that yes, while floods have occurred uh, since 1913, they haven't been as large with that. And the most recent one of note was the one in 2018 that ranked only 21st on our list of top 100 uh, floods in Lafayette. So again, they've been a lot less than what we had back in 1913. In fact, the 1883 was called the Great Flood by the locals for about what, 30 years, okay? So <laughs> until the 1913 flood. Could it happen again? Well, a field inundation study, a flood inundation study was done in 2018 to say, could it? And what they did is they mapped out something that looks like this. And I'll get a close up of it here for you. But essentially, what it shows is that the blue area it would be inundated with a 29 foot flood. Now, remember, the, the 1913 flood was 33 feet. Okay. So 29 feet, which is probably about two to three feet above what we would get at our highest floods here now. This would result in this inundation. And what you see a little bit different is that unlike the 1913 flood where the Main Street and Brown Street levee were inundated, they wouldn't be with this 19, with a 29 foot flood because this has all been built up. But do you see a problem here? Exactly. Now what you have is the water basically flowing from up here through a narrower area. And what was the problem with the Main Street bridge? The fast velocity basically scoured the ground underneath it and destabilized the bridge. So will we have problems again in the future? Maybe, maybe. In fact, the official report from the Silver Jackets website points out that there are three reservoirs that have been put in to reduce the amount of water flowing into or control the amount of water flowing into the Wabash um, River Basin. But major river flooding is still possible in the Lafayette area, even with these things. And that's from the Corps of Engineers. And these guys usually know what they're talking about. Okay, so now I've got a, a question for you. And it relates to an object right here. And I'm gonna show this for our folks at home, just so they can see. This is, this says on it, Lafayette Bridge Company Builders, Lafayette, Indiana. And on the back of it, written in pencil, which of course I can always trust, <laughs> it says Brown Street Bridge. Well, I bought it knowing that it probably wasn't actually related to the Brown Street Bridge, but I am curious about it. So I did some investigation. I need your help on this, because this is a mystery. Lafayette Bridge Company did build many bridges in Indiana, specifically mostly in the 1890s. And again, uh, Marshall Wallace, or, or Wallace, Wallace Marshall and his son, Henry Marshall, are very, um, huge names in Indiana and Lafayette. But most of these bridges were built in 1890s. The Iron Brown Street Bridge was built in 1903 by the Attica Bridge Company, not the Lafayette Bridge Company. So this plaque does not come from that wrecked 1913 bridge, Brown Street Bridge. So we can rule that out. However, the original Brown Street covered bridge, the wooden one, was built by the Lafayette Bridge Company, an iteration of that company in the early days. Did this come off of that? I don't know, unless there was metal structure in that wooden covered bridge. So it doesn't quite make sense. So where did it come from? Well, we can rule out almost all the other bridges built by the Lafayette Bridge Company in the, in the 1890s because they all had these characteristic medallions that indicated who was the construction and who oftentimes the county commissioners that commissioned the work. So the very large amount of way up on the trusses and they had nothing like that. Now there are smaller placards that are put on smaller non-trust bridges where they have high trusses, but they can see it looks very different in the plaque over here, okay? Now there were ditch bridges that Lafayette Bridge Company did produce, 
But again, if they were going to produce any kind of a um, placard on that, it probably would be a square placard similar to what you saw with the, uh, with the other one. <clears throat> so the question is, given that this medallion is a completely different design from the bridges that Lafayette Bridge Company constructed in the 1890s, and there's no photographic evidence that I've been able to find of a similar medallion, is this possibly a medallion off the original Brown Street covered bridge? Don't know. But if anybody has an idea, let me know, because it's still a mystery. Well, I want to thank Arnie Sweet and uh, Kelly Lippy for donating many of the photos that we had that are included in our book, The uh, Tiffany County in the 1913 Flood. And thanks for your attention. Okay, thank you very much. All right, well, I'll tell you what, we, uh, since we're kind of, kind of going along a little bit, I'll stick around if you got any questions with that. Otherwise, thank you for coming. I hope you learned something today. Okay. Uh, <laughs> good question. Question was, how do we get this book? Available at most fine book to sellers. Um, is actually, Barnes and Nobles has this, Amazon has this. Um, you can go online, pretty much get it. <laughs> and eBay has it. And the Tippecanoe Battlefield, Battlefield, Battlefield Museum, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Leslie, yeah. Uh, in fact, there, there's somebody from Australia that's selling this book for uh, considerably cheaper, but then Australian dollars are a lot cheaper than US dollars. Oh yeah, that's true. <laughs> There's another book that was put out at the same time by the same publisher that was Indiana floods of 19 and 1913 that has a very, very similar looking appearance with a slightly different photograph, but it, it's not as good. So anyway, <laughs> and it actually has, it actually has the old story, the myth story about uh, Eli's Eli's rescue, etc. on it. So anyway, but that's out there too. Um, so, okay, very good. Any other quick questions before we break? Yes, ma'am. Do you have any um, pictures or, or explanations of the um, construction machinery that would have been used in that era, mm -hmm. like the the cranes, or mm -hmm. I saw a wagon or something with enormous wheels. But yep. just to think about, okay, what were they using? Yeah, and back at that time, again, all steam driven, and again, a lot of a lot of the work was actually done. They did have some cranes, but a lot of the work was actually done with those steam pile drivers. That was the real heavy work. As far as moving the metal in and so forth, they did have cranes and dollies that they did, some of which were actually were manual uh, cranes and dollies. But yeah, it was it was very different the way they did it, and sometimes very creative because they didn't have the horsepower, the force that we do today. Yeah. Those people were really good witted, though. Yeah, I mean, you had to be or you died. So quickly, <laughs> okay, what can we do? Okay, what do we have? Yep. You know, it's pretty amazing. It really is. It really is. Yeah, that's a good point. Yes, sir. You know. Or anybody know the engineering technology to go down to bedrock? Do they still use that same kind of all the way and planks? And no, they 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 don't use it obviously in the same sort of way, but they have to use the same kind of principle, which is you have to get down deep enough, and if you don't have bedrock to go to, you have to find some means to create a large enough pad on which any pillar is placed, and so. Exactly right. Exactly right. And again, celery bog. We know what happened out in celery bog. How many bridges did we go through there before we got away from the roller coaster? You know, and it was all because it sunk in. Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question about the damage from the flood. I, my grandparents, my father's parents, uh, after they were married in 1906, they moved to a house down around Fourth and Brown. Mm -hmm. And there's still some homes down there. And I, I was thinking one of them might. Might have been where they live, but was it possible that they survived the, the flood? Mm -hmm. Quite possible. Um, and one of the pictures that we couldn't see because uh, it, uh, because of the glitch up here was actually showing a picture of 9th Street out as you go out towards Greenbush and the cemetery. There is a picture of that. Flood did get up to 9th Street, but only out there. If you're closer into town, it got no further than 3rd Street. For example, the post office was inundated in its basement, but didn't have any water really above its front steps. So here in, in Center Lafayette, we had it a little farther north of town, it got a little farther inland. So at Brown and Forth, they probably were safe. However, 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. they, and, they, and they probably were, but they probably had some water in their basement. The one thing that, that I didn't talk about is that um, on Thursday of this flood week, that particular week, the newspapers suddenly sent an alarm out by AP Press that reached Lafayette that the Salina Dam in Ohio, which was a mere short distance from the headwaters of the Wabash, had broken. If it had, it would have sent about 10 feet of water down the river to Lafayette. Word reached Lafayette that this was going to happen. All the police, all the carriages, all the carts and everything that were downtown already were mobilized to move people from that area up to higher ground, anticipating a sudden 10 foot rise of water that was gonna be coming down as a cascading torrent. As it turned out, it didn't happen. And a second press release that finally came out about four hours later, basically said, the dam is secure. There is no problem. So again, so they, so they were okay. <laughs> they, they were gone by then. They moved up to the stage. Oh, okay. <laughs> Very good. When did yes. you say that false alarm was? Uh, it was on Thursday of that, uh, of that uh, flood week. So that would have been March 26th, I think. Yep. Oh. Did the uh, St. Anne's area flood, my Shamrock Park and all that? And I've got uh, pictures that I didn't show in here, but they are in the book that show uh, St. Anne's Cathedral. And it shows the old straw board factory that used to be in that neighborhood also. And St. Anne's Cathedral is all surrounded by water. That whole area down there flooded quite a bit, all the way up to about, uh, probably about 5th or 6th Street, at least. Yeah. Very good. All right. Well, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Hope you learned something.